Okay. Yeah, so our great video of David Attenborough back in 1979, uh, looking at the relationships between insects and flowers was so interesting because really, would insects have moved onto land without the plants? Would plants have done so well without the insects moving onto land? Um, so we're gonna talk about that. This is an oak tree. You can always tell an oak because of the lobed leaves. They're very distinct looking. And of course, what is this? I think that's from Ice Age, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's the acorn from Ice Age. <laughs> that, that funny little animal. Yeah, pursued all over. That was quite funny. He cracked yeah. me up. <laughs> an acorn. It has been said that an oak tree is just an acorn's way of making more acorns. I love that expression. Um, that is a great expression. So in the Darwinian view of life, uh, fitness of an organism is measured by its ability to replace itself with healthy and fertile offspring. So plants reproduce. Is sexual reproduction that we just saw, the pollinating of flowers by insects and wind, water, um, is sexual reproduction the only way plants reproduce? Uh, no. No, exacto mundo. So there are many species that reproduce asexually as well. If, if they reproduce asexually, what are their offspring like? Are they different Gnomes. or the same? Clones. Gnomes. Yeah, they're clones. Good, yeah. So uh, they're really... Um, is a good reason for sexual reproduction. Although how it evolved is still a little bit of a mystery. So plants exhibit both, asexual and sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction produces seeds. Here's a, a parasitic plant. This isn't the same one that was in Attenborough's movie. This one is huge. It's an enormous flower. It produces up to 4 million seeds. And pollination is the way in which the gametes, the eggs and sperm, can come together within a flower. Angiosperm, which refers to flowering plants, um, which also means covered seed, the dominant sporophyte, so all the plants that you see, the trees, the shrubs, the herbaceous plants, they're all sporophytes. And they produce spores that develop within flowers into male gametophytes, and those are the pollen grains, or female gametophytes, and those are embryo sacs. So the sporophyte is diploid. Diploid, the adult plant, and produces haploid spores by meiosis. And the gametophytes produce gametes, uh, sperm within the pollen grains and eggs within the embryo sacs. Gametophytes produce gametes. 
phyte, P-H-Y-T-E always refers to plants. And fertilization of those two results in a diploid zygote. And the zygote divides and forms more sporophytes. So the only plant out there really that you'll see that is not a diploid a sporophyte as an adult are mosses. Mosses that you see, the, the, the obvious form of mosses are um, gametophytes. So they're all haploid. And the only sporophyte of a moss is a, is a tiny little stalk that grows out of a patch of moss and produces spores. So in angiosperms, the, the sporophyte is the dominant generation. It's the conspicuous one. plants that we have. Here is an overview of angiosperm reproduction. Angiosperms um, are a sporophyte and they produce a very unique structure, the flower. And as you saw in the film, man, flowers can take so many different forms. So here's a flower and, and you heard a lot of these terms. Some of them may be a little bit different now. Um, this is the receptacle on which sepals sit. Sepals are part of the flower that, that cover the flower when it's still a bud. Our petals. The stamen is the male part of the flower, and it consists of a filament and an anther, and the anther contains the pollen grains. The carpal is the female part of the plant. Um, it is um, consisting of a style that has a stigma on the top. That's where the pollen grains land. It's usually sticky in some way, as well as the ovary. That's all part of the carpal. That's called an idealized flower because not all flowers have all of those parts. There are flowers that are considered incomplete because they don't have all four of those parts. The carpels, the stamens, the sepals, and the petals. Those are the main ones. Hey, can I ask, like, is it really common, do you know, to be an idealized flower or is it quite uncommon? Um, that is a good question. It depends on whether you're a herbaceous plant or a shrub. So um, herbaceous flowers that just grow from one plant tend to be complete, but shrubs can have many flowers on the same plant. So they tend to be uh, either male or female. Some shrubs have both male and female and some shrubs have only female while other shrubs have only male. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is the um, overview, an overview of angiosperm reproduction. So let's see, where should we start? Let's start with the adult. Here's the adult flower. Um, in this case, the, the pollen is landing on the stigma and we're going to go over this, but the pollen has um, 
two cells, a generative cell and a tube cell. And the tube cell uh, grows a tube all the way down to a little entrance to the ovary. So this is the ovary down here. I should do that in a different color. The ovary. Um, this is the embryo sac. And this is the egg. And that's the female gametophyte. The ovule is, is within the embryo sac. Yeah, so fertilization occurs in the ovary. And when it occurs, um, the fertilization produces a zygote. The zygote starts to grow into an embryo. And the embryo is diploid, of course, because of uh, fertilization. It's now sporophyte. And then the ovary itself develops into fruit. The ovule um, develops into a seed. So this is the seed. And then the seed is dispersed. And then the, the seed must germinate somewhere. Uh, when it does, it grows roots and shoots and grows into an adult, which eventually will uh, produce flowers. So that's a simplified angiosperm life cycle. So flowers are reproductive shoots of the angiosperm sporophyte. And they're composed of four floral organs. Those are sepals, petals, stamens, and carpels. Those are the four. And um, unlike the rest of the plant, which has indeterminate growth, flowers have determinate growth. At the stage of life when they're growing, they just simply grow to one size. Um, the attachment site of the floral organs is known as a receptacle. And even sometimes the receptacle can turn into fruit. So uh, apples, for example, are receptacles. There's a lot of variation in what, what happens. Lots and lots and lots and lots of different forms. Uh, some have radial symmetry, some have bilateral symmetry. An orchid has bilateral symmetry, meaning that it's uh, symmetrical on the left and right sides. Um, some have radial symmetry, like this daffodil. But the daffodil has fused petals. That's what makes it a tube flower. The petals have fused together. Um, there can be different locations for an ovary. A superior ovary is above the receptacle. Um, an inferior ovary, ovary is below the receptacle. And semi-inferior is somewhere in between. So the ovary can have different locations. Um, lupine inflorescence, inflorescence um, and sunflowers, they are a collection of flowers, many flowers collected in one place is known as an inflorescence. Lots of variation. Uh, maize is a monoecious species. That means that the males and females flowers on the same plant. But um, a common arrow, arrowhead plant, the latifolia, is dioecious. That means that the male and female flowers are on different plants. And of course, petals can be very brightly colored. So the purpose of petals is to attract uh, pollinators.
So lots of variation and lots of colors and lots of patterns. A number of flowers in a single structure. and pollination methods. So they can vary quite a lot. So a complete flower is one that has all four organs. Is your computer gonna die, Maria? You need to plug no, it I in. No, just, I just plugged it in. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I had I had plugged it into the actual laptop, but then it was unplugged elsewhere. Ah, too many things plugged in around here. Um, all four uh, floral organs. An incomplete flower doesn't have all four. So this is not weed, doesn't have any petals, for example. Um, a perfect flower has of both stamens, that is terrible writing, and carpels. So both male and female, but an imperfect flower, which is, they used to be called perfect and imperfect. Now I think they're called bisexual and unisexual, it's just a different name for the same thing. So is only is either, male or female, but not both. So pollination is the beginning of the process in which male and female gametophytes are brought together so their gametes can unite. That wasn't the next slide. <laughs> oh, here's another example of monoecious plants. And you might have seen these that this looks like an alder. It might be an alder, actually. Uh, female catkins, they're called catkins, and male catkins. So those are the female flowers and the male flowers. Uh, but they don't really look much like flowers because they're wind pollinated. Wind pollination usually results in small and conspicuous looking flowers. A dioecious plant here. Um, one plant here has the male flowers and a different plant has the female flowers. Two plants. One plant. Not that obvious in the picture. Yeah, so pollination. That's what the insects were doing. And that's sometimes what wind does and, and water and mammals even begins the process by which the male and female gametophytes, those are the structures that um, develop the gametes are brought together so their gametes can unite. And pollination, pollen is released by anthers and carried by wind or animals to land on the stigma. And here's an example of some really neat looking pollen grains. There, no pollen grains are the same for, for different species. And they have appendages. I think that one's, this one, oh, this one is chamomile. I don't know the species. This one is a chamomile pollen grain. You can see how different they look. So they're very specific for the species that they are. They're very specific for the stigma of this, their same species. And they're quite unique. And that's why, you know, maybe you watched um, 
Bones, that was my favorite show for a long time, <laughs> which is about a forensic anthropologist. And then there's one of the lab scientists who's always saying, this, these, these pollen grains on this dead body can only be from this part of the world. And then they find the miscreant that way. <laughs> I know that diatoms have famously solved a number of murder cases. Uh -huh. <laughs> My forensic <laughs> yeah. file watching the unique right. diatoms can be isolated to a single pond. Well, there's a single pond. That's amazing. The single pond where the unfortunate drowned, I suppose. Or was merely disposed of. Ah, oh, yes. Or oh, yes, right. <laughs> I watch oh, so much dear. true crime, I'm ready to either commit or solve a murder. Undecided. <laughs> I hope it's solved. <laughs> Me too. So wind pollination, uh, you can see the flowers are very simple looking flowers. Dandelions, they just distribute their, well, dandelions distribute their seed by wind and their pollen as well. And grasses tend to be quite nondescript because they just release their pollen by wind um, and they don't have to attract insects. But of course, other ones do. These are stinkhorn beetles. I don't really think of beetles that much when it comes to pollination, but there is, beetles are of an enormous quantity. Of course, they're the most um, um, abundant insects. And so they do a lot of pollination. Moths. And here's the skunk cabbage. Skunk cabbage, I was gonna say, cool. <laughs> so if you're anywhere near bogs or the edges of lakes even. Yeah, ponds, I grew up in Pocoquitlam. So all those boggy areas are just filled with skunk cabbage, all the drainage yeah. ditches. And how does it smell? like skunk. I, I don't find <laughs> exactly. it that bad, you know, it smells like like that skunky weed almost. It does to me, it's, well, I can't tell the difference between marijuana and um, skunk cabbage. When you're walking through the park, it, they're like everybody. Yeah, fresh, no, I park, agree. So I can't tell like, the difference oh. from fresh skunk <laughs> cabbage and fresh skunk weed. No. <laughs> so this, this is the spadix. So this is a number of flowers, many, 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 many flowers. And that's where the beetles uh, like to mate. That's so cool, but I've never seen the beetles in there. I figured there must be mad footage of the beetles in skunk cabbage, eh? Uh, yeah, I didn't find an image, but I'm sure that there are images out there for sure. Um, what I find fascinating is a type of pollination called buzz frequency pollination. So. What makes these anthers pop and distribute their pollen is the frequency of the bee's wings. And I think that's what it's called, buzz frequency. No way, I did not know that. It's fascinating, really. So the, the anther pops and the pollen spreads out over the animal. I'm on is dioecious. So an angiosperm's pollination is the transfer of pollen from an anther to a stigma. That's what pollination is called. If it's successful, a pollen grain produces a pollen tube, uh, which grows down into the ovary and discharges sperm near the embryo sac. And pollen develops from microspores within the sporangia of the anther. Sporangia are those structures that produce spores. So here's a pollen sac, also known as a microsporangium. And the microsporangia are, um, contain microsporocytes, uh, also known as microspore mother cells. They're diploid and go through meiosis, producing four microspores. Each microsporocyte divides by meiosis to produce four haploids. Yeah, here's the four haploids here. Sorry, we're out of, out of sync a little bit. There's our four haploids. 
And each of those four develops into a pollen grain. And the pollen grain is interesting because it includes a generative cell that will produce two sperm eventually and a tube cell. And this is the nucleus of the tube cell here and here. That's the larger cell. So after the pollen grain lands on the stigma of a carpal, then the pollen tube begins to grow and the generative nucleus divides and forms two sperm. So two nuclei and two sperm. So that is the male part of the story. The female part of the story is this. Within the ovules, there are uh, megasporangium. Um, a large diploid cell called a megasporocyte, which also the ovule also has integuments and micropyle. Those are different structure, structures of the megasporangium. So within this structure, uh, the sur there's only one surviving megaspore after meiosis, very similar to um, most animals. With the females, only one structure survives as the megaspore. And it goes through mitosis. Well, actually, first what happens is that um, there is a multiplication of nuclei. And then those multiplications of nuclei are separated by membranes forming these different cells, antipodal cells and antip antipodal cells, the function of which I don't think is known a polar nuclei, so these are the polar nuclei, and they will eventually fuse with one of the sperm to form a multinucleate endosperm structure, which is food, will become food for the embryo, and um, an egg, and two synergids, and the synergids are at an opening, and it's believed that they release uh, calcium or another chemical to attract the pollen tube that will grow down the uh, style. So you've got uh, microspores and megaspores. Eventually, the our, um, microspore, which has developed the uh, tube cell and the generative cell, will be encased in a very, very hard outer coating. So pollen grains, they're really hard to crack open. Um, it's not until they land on a stigma and some enzymes break down that outer coating that the generative tube can grow. So I think there's, as far as I know, there's one organism that lives in soil. What is it? Um, it has really, really tough pincers and it can crack a pollen grain, but I forget what it is now. But not many animals can crack the pollen grain. So, how is self-fertilization prevented? We saw that one method with the, the neat, uh, um, what's it called again, an arum, the arum with the female flowers and the male flowers, uh, male flowers and female flowers in completely different places. Yeah, there's like a couple of techniques then you could separate by time sure. or by space, right? Yes, yes, right, exactly. So that is a combination of time and space. Um, 
In this case, you've got a pin flower where the anthers are below the stigma. So they're unlikely to pollinate itself or fertilize itself. Um, so the anti-selfing mechanisms known as self incompatibility, um, flowers mostly reject their own pollen and it's a molecular mechanism. Uh, rejected pollen usually has an S gene matching an allele uh, in the stigma cells. Uh, they reject pollen that has that gene. The recognition of that self pollen triggers a signal transduction pathway. So it's this a series of chemical reactions uh, that leads to a block in the growth of the pollen tube. So the whole sequence of events uh, triggered by the S gene um, results in a block of the pollen tube. And after fertilization, the ovules develop into seeds and the ovaries into fruit. I have a whole lot of notes about self incompatibility. Okay, that's where I'd like to stop now. And we shall continue a little bit later on. Thank you for watching.